What is the difference between generative AI and assistive AI? We're starting to see a lot of companies require disclosures on whether or not you've used AI based on whether it's generative or assistive. So let's break this down with everybody's favorite IP and entertainment lawyer, Tony, and give you some really great examples so that you can be equipped to figure this out on your own. Now we have other videos on this as well, where I give you really good examples and ways to figure this out. So I will link that down below for you, but this is straight from the lawyer's mouth. My name is Tony Lee Casas. I'm an adjunct professor of entertainment law and IP at New York Law School and I have an Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok account called The IP Professor that is dedicated to all things in talk to property. Tony, we've been talking about generative AI versus assistive AI. And we've had lots of really great discussions here on the channel, lots of episodes of you, but I really want to break this down from a legal standpoint. What is the difference between generative and assistive AI? Great question. And I think a lot of people, especially with the proliferation of AI in recent months, have seemed to compound the two together, right? So generative AI is where the artificial intelligence system, whether that's, let's say, an AI platform like ChatGPT or Stability AI or Dolly, all of those platforms do the work for you. So mm -hmm. it all is contingent on the input that you provide. So if you were to go on ChatGPT and you set and you wrote, write me a book about a, a coming of age story of a kid who smells like cheese and he comes to grips with the fact that he's going to smell like cheese for the rest of his life. I know that's like so original, but um, either way, he does the, the, you put that as the input, the output is going to be the platform chat GPT writing out the entirety of that book. Now I have tested this out before they really don't do uh, a good job of like writing full chapters. They'll do like more of a synopsis. So then there's very much of a hand-holding process with ChatGPT where you have to follow it up and say, well, could you embellish it with a little bit more detail? Maybe write a full-length chapter for each one. And that's where it will pr probably perform a little better than what it did in the initial input. But nonetheless, that's an example of input that then provides output. Another good example would be if you went on Stability AI and you asked the platform, um, generate an image in the style of Van Gogh of a dog eating a hamburger it provides that output and it will show a dog eating a hamburger in the style of Van Gogh. Again, this is all based on input that you, the user provide that then creates the output. The problem with, with that though, is what we've talked about all these other times, which is that generative AI generated works, that's a mouthful, but anything gener generated using artificial intelligence, meaning the input output process, that has not been deemed as worthy of copyright protection. Landmark case from a three from three weeks ago. We've talked about it before. Uh, Thaler versus Perlmutter. This is the case where the Dr. Stephen Thaler sued the copyright office for basically not allowing his AI-generated work to receive copyright protection. The DC District Court said, "Not so fast, Mr. Thaler, uh, Dr. Thaler. This generated generative AI work cannot get copyright protection because this was not created using." Uh, human author, this lacks substantial human involvement. Now, that is where this discussion of generative AI creates like this fracas, if you will, in the community, because there are some people that say, well, the input is very minimal, but I'm still, uh, it's my idea. I have an idea in my head and I'm providing it as input. I, 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 I dispute that a lot because and by having that argument, you're basically saying that what generative AI is presenting is a tool, but that's not the case. What generative AI is basically doing is it's replacing what you would have already done. If I knew that I wanted an image of a dog eating a hamburger in the style of Van Gogh, I would at least try. I would pick up a pen and paper. I would illustrate it to the extent that I know what Van Gogh drawings look like, what a dog looks like, what a hamburger looks like, and at least the idea that's in my head would be expressed based on my own creative vision in some form on pen and paper or on a canvas with paint or any other medium, if you will. And mm -hmm. that's the heart of the idea expression dichotomy that runs through the veins of copyright law, that it's one thing to have an idea because it's not, co it's not copyrightable, it's not protected, but it's the idea that is conceived of in my head that is can only be comprehended and appreciated by a human that then is put to paper or expressed in some other form, that's where something now all of a sudden musters the strength to become worthy of copyright protection. That's where I think this great divide does exist in the AI community about this specific point. So generative AI, again, it's really about the, the system, the server, the, what, the platform doing the work for you. 
This is different from assistive AI. Assistive AI is a supplement to the existing work of authorship that you have spent time, effort, maybe even money working on. So I think a great example of that is if let's say I recorded a YouTube video that was talking, let's say an instructional on copyright law. And I talk about all the different works of authorship that are covered under copyright. And I discuss the Copyright Act of 1976. Let's say it's a 10 minute video and I don't have the time to sit back and transcribe every single aspect of a word that I wrote. Mm -hmm. But I have software that would, uh, you know, basically listen to the audio that I created or the, uh, the video that I created and would transcribe in real time what I wrote. That's assistive AI. And that would not assassinate any attempt at me trying to take that video and register it in the copyright office. Because at the end of the day, I still was the one that set up a camera that pressed the shutter button and decided to record myself talking in front of a camera. That effort, that act was not done using artificial intelligence. That act was done by these 10 digits right here. That act was done with my mind, with the vision of what I wanted to talk about on camera. That's mm -hmm. where it, there still, uh, well, there definitely is some type of copyrightability with that act. The, the use of a software to create captions that's just assistive. That's just a little supplement to it, but that is not a replacement of the overall work of authorship that I spent time working on. So I think that's the core distinction between generative AI versus assistive AI. Mm -hmm. Again, generative AI does the work for you, the human author. Assistive AI just acts like Robin. You know, basically it's like Batman and Robin. It is the Robin to you, Batman. It's just helping create a little extra something uh, that supplements all the hard work that you spent in creating that work of authorship. And we get lots of questions about this on the channel. So let's break this down even further. One of the examples I love to give is related to videos. If I were to create a video and I just told an AI, I need a video on a topic and it came up with a script, it created some animations for me, it did the voiceover, that's generative. It is creating that for me. Even if I put part of the elements into it, it's still creating it and doing the work for me. If, however, I create my script, I film my video, but I'm reading my script off to the side and I use AI to change the location of where I'm looking. That is going to be assistive because I've done the bulk of the work. I've filmed it. I have written the script. I read the script. I did the work. It's just assisting and kind of changing things a little bit. Whereas generative created the entire thing. Assistive is just taking what I've already done and tweaking it a little bit. So Tony, let me do a little bit of a rapid fire. We're going to give some of the examples that people like to do. And you're going to let us know, is it more generative or is it more assistive? One of the big ones is something like a spell check. Is that going to be more assistive or generative? Assistive, no questions asked. <laughs> because it's helping with what you've already done. It saves you a lot of time and effort. But when it comes to something like writing your script for a video, is that going to be generative or assistive? Totally generative because it's doing the work for you. You would have spent the time writing that script, but the system is doing that work for you. Okay, let's dig a little deeper. Let's say I am giving it a bullet point list of what I wanted to talk about in my video script. Generative or assistive? Uh, that's probably going to be... Um, a bit more. That's a good question. I, I'm I'm on the fence on that one. I would probably lean a little bit towards generative in that one, um, because if I'm providing the bullet point list and it creates like certain that's output great. that's based on that, it's I'm still even though I spent time writing out like let's say general themes, again it's going towards the the system is essentially filling in the lines for me. So I would now that I'm talking out loud, it's probably going to be more generative. And that's definitely where I lean with with that one as well, because you're just implementing some ideas into it, but it's doing the bulk of the work, even if I'm doing some tweaking on the back end of that. Now we get a lot of questions with low content book creations for something like Amazon, where people say they are creating things with AI, and then they're just cleaning up some lines, removing some extra fingers and things like that. So if people are creating coloring book pages or puzzles where they're feeding in a list of things, but it's doing the work, would that be more generative or assistive? Generative AI. I, I, I'm, I would go to the mountaintop saying that for sure, even though there are no mountains here in New York. It's all the way up in upstate New York. So I will, take, I will take the trip to Bear Mountain in upstate New York just to say generative AI. I love it. So if you are in a position where you're trying to figure this out, the general rule is if it's doing the work and you're tweaking things, it's generative. 
And if you are doing the work and then it's helping you on the back end to tweak some things, it's going to be more assistive. If you've got questions, feel free to drop those down below for us. We would love to get them answered for you in upcoming videos. Tony's coming back to keep us legally protected in the entrepreneurial space. And as always, you can reach out to Tony on his social medias. Tony, where can everybody find you? You can find me on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok at The IP Professor. You can check out my entertainment law podcast called End Scene. New episodes drop every Friday on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Drop your questions on AI down below. And don't forget, we have a full playlist on how you can legally, ethically, and creatively be using AI inside of your entrepreneurial journey to save time ever so that this can be your most profitable year ever with less time commitment, with less stress to make sure that you are leveling up what you're doing, but you're still creating luxury time in your business because your business is working for you without you having to be hands-on every minute of every day. We'll see you in the upcoming episodes.